Okay, hello, it seems we're live. So welcome to my talk in these strange times. Uh, my name is Bartosz Golaszewski and I'll be talking about uh, GPIOs in Linux user space. And while I'll try to keep this presentation fairly accessible to beginners, uh, I won't be going into much detail about the things I covered during uh, previous presentations when I was already talking about GPIOs in Linux. Uh, I just post some links to my previous talks in the slides. Uh, and with that out of the way, uh, I'll start with some background. So uh, I'm with Bailibre. We are based in Southern France, uh, plus we have some people scattered all over the world. And we are right now around uh, 40, mostly senior engineers. And we do a bit of uh, everything. So we do upstream kernel development and maintenance. We help clients launch projects from concept through design and implementation up to manufacturing. Uh, we are also the founding members of kernel CI and we regularly contribute to many open source projects. And personally, I've been working in the field for 10 years now. Uh, I work most, I work throughout the, the stack. So from bootloaders through the Linux kernel up to low level user space and build tools. Uh, and what's important for this talk is I wrote and maintain libgpiod and co-maintain the GPIO subsystem in Linux. And yeah, I also contribute to, to many other projects like uh, Uboot, Yocto, uh, and so on. And so this presentation will actually be much different than what I imagined when writing the abstract a couple months ago. And it's not only because I, I thought uh, I'd be physically present in Austin, but uh, also the subject matter of this uh, uh, of this presentation changed significantly. Uh, so in one line of the abstract, uh, I said something like this. The GPIO character device has been extended with uh, new features in Linux 5.5 and final new additions before declaring it feature complete are planned for uh, 5.6 and 5.7. So this uh, is all wrong. Uh, basically, we, we got a serious reality check when we started receiving some bug reports on the mailing list and some feature requests that were uh, sensible by all means, but which we just couldn't implement without uh, breaking the ABI. Um, and uh, yeah, breaking the ABI of the current interface. And uh, all in all, this uh, line in the abstract should uh, be changed to something like this. Uh, the GPIO character device has been extended with new features in Linux 5.5, but due to shortcomings, the first version of the ABI, the existing IOCTL calls are being retired and V2 uh, of the ABI is being introduced, aiming at the uh, release as part of Linux 5.9, hopefully. Uh, so there you have it. Uh, with this in mind, let's maybe dynamically change the title of the presentation to Linux GPIO, a lesson in user API design. So welcome again to my talk. Uh, and uh, I'll be talking about what to keep in mind when designing user facing interface uh, interfaces in the Linux kernel in the in the context of Linux GPIOs. So the agenda for today is as follows. Uh, first, I'll discuss the current state of the GPIO user API. Um, I'll talk about the deprecated SysFS interface. Uh, I'll briefly describe the character, character device uh, basics and then go to the recently added new features, including but uh, not limited to the GPIO aggregator. Uh, next, we'll talk about the work happening right now on the new version of the GPIO UAPI. Uh, I'll cover, I, I, I'll talk about what's wrong in the current ABI, what new features are being worked on, and I'll also talk on what to pay attention to when designing uh, user facing uh, interfaces. And lastly, I'll talk about, uh, I'll talk a bit about the user space part of the GPIO interface, which is the GPIOD. And uh, again, I'll talk mostly about new features and the upcoming development because uh, the, the, most of the of the features already existing uh, have been covered previously. So let's start with the current state of GPIO uh, user API in Linux. So what uh, what you normally do with GPIOs in the kernel uh, in, in Linux kernel is to try to use them from the kernel space. That is, you should aim at writing drivers for your hardware. Uh, 
uh, and use the internal GPIO interface, but that's not always possible or maybe even desirable. Uh, and there are many cases where you'd want to control GPIOs from user space. Uh, examples are, of such use cases are power switches and relays, uh, various devices that are controlled in, in big part from user space, for example, GPS. Uh, also, certain users simply seem to prefer to control elements of their hardware uh, from high-level user space applications. And this is uh, prevalent in robotics and home automation. And in 2008, the GPIO subsystem was quite different, different from what we have today. There were no GPIO descriptors. Uh, there was only the global GPIO number space and also there, uh, were no, there was no GPIO maintainer. Uh, so uh, it's during that time that the GPIO SysFS interface was merged. Uh, and today it's really, it's, 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 it's really become apparent that it's outdated and has many drawbacks, which were the reason to implement the character device in the first place. So first, the, the state of the GPIOs is not tied to any process. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's global in the system. So for instance, if a process modifies the state uh, of certain lines or just exports some lines and then dies the settings aren't reset. Uh, and of course, that also makes it possible to access the lines concurrently uh, from many processes and no process can really own the lines. Uh, the API is quite cumbersome uh, with many uh, attributes in different SysFS files. Uh, things like looking up lines by name uh, are complicated. Uh, and by far the worst part of the interface uh, is the fact that it represents a concept that is a two-level hierarchy as a, as a flat number space. Uh, precisely what we did in the all deprecated kernel interface. Uh, but this is especially wrong since the global GPIO numbers uh, are dynamic. And, and unless a driver explicitly makes it static, uh, it can change depending on the ordering of modules being loaded. Um, and yeah, and th there are even bizarre caveats with uh, GPIOs and CFS, like the fact that if you export a line by writing a number to the export attribute, it normally shows up as a new directory called uh, GPIO number. Uh, but if the line is named, it will show up as a new directory with that line's name, uh, which is uh, some way of looking up lines by name, but it's not really intuitive and um, makes the SysFS behave uh, in a non-consistent way, let's, let's call it. Uh, so I'd really like to stress the need to move away from this interface because even last year in Lyon, uh, during the ELCE, it was brought to my attention that there, that there was a talk presenting, among others, the SysFS GPIO interface. So we're working hard to remove the global number space from the kernel, but SysFS is one of those uh, things that will block us for the foreseeable future. So yeah, please don't use it anymore. Uh, it's now disabled by default anyway. So. Uh, since Linux 4.8, we have a new interface for GPIOs in user space, uh, and that is the character device. So now for every GPIO chip, we export a device file in the dev slash dev directory. Uh, it can be accessed and acted on using standard Linux, uh, system, standard, standard Unix system calls, um, open, poll, read, uh, IOPL. Uh, and this time the state is tied to the process owning the file descriptor. Uh, and it reverts to default when the process closes uh, the relevant file descriptor manually or um, closes, uh, closes, closes it by, by, by simply dying. Uh, and uh, we now can manipulate multiple lines at once. Uh, we can easily look up chips and, chips and lines by name. Uh, we have several config options unsupported by SysFS, like the drive flags. Uh, bias flags, uh, we have visible consumer names, uh, U-event notifications, and finally, we have something uh, interesting, which is the reliable, which is reliable polling. Because actually, previously in, uh, in SysFS, uh, some, many, many people are not aware of that, polling for line events was possible. Uh, but uh, it was quite unreliable and cumbersome. So when in SysFS, when you export, export a GPIO line, uh, you can open the value attribute and poll it for input events. And when you get an event, uh, when poll uh, reports an event, it means that there has been uh, a, a change in, in, uh, in line value. Now, what you need to do to uh, read the current value is to either close and reopen the value attribute, or you have to LC to its beginning uh, and read the, the ASCII value uh, the, the ASCII value from, from, from the attribute. And uh, 
as, as you can tell, this is quite uh, racy because there could have been multiple changes, uh, multiple line events during that time. And so with the character device, this works much better because now the events are queued in a buffer in the kernel. Every time an interrupt is handled, a new event is put into the kernel of FIFO. And yeah, unless this buffer overflows, uh, it can be read one by one from user space. Uh, poll, uh, the poll system call will return an input event as, as long as there are events queued. And uh, yeah, this allows to implement simple bit banging from user space. Uh, this will be uh, actually made even more reliable in V2, but uh, I'll be talking about it in a minute. Uh, and so I don't want to get into much detail about the character device, uh, uh, about the, about all the features. Uh, I will focus on the new features, but uh, this is the link for the, for the, for my talk that happened uh, in St. Petersburg during the Linux Peter in 2018, I think, uh, which covers, uh, basically all features of, of the, of, of the kernel UAPI and libgpiod. Lib uh, so what I want to talk about are the new features. So, uh, recently we've had some development happening. Um, the, 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 the first interesting new feature is the new set config hierarchy. So one of the drawbacks, uh, we identified in the character device was the fact that you cannot change the configuration of a requested line without releasing it and requesting it again. And this is uh, obviously racy as someone may simply grab the line when it's released and we cannot even change the direction from user space while maintaining the ownership of the line. So the answer to that is the set config IOCO. Basically, it allows to change the configuration flags for a set of requested lines. Uh, unfortunately, for now, this doesn't work with lines requested for events, but this will be addressed in, uh, in, the, in, the, in version two uh, of the API. Uh, Basically, you have to use a very simple structure which contains the field for the flags, which is uh, analogous to uh, to the one we have in the config structure uh, used when we do re when, we, when we when we call the request uh, line request line line handle request uh, IOCTL. Uh, and we also have optional default values uh, used when changing the direction to output. This is also a counterpart counterpart of the one uh, of the field used in the in the config structure. And uh, the next feature is something that has been requested for a long time, but we simply somehow couldn't, could not really agree on a, on a proper approach, which turned out to be uh, relatively simple in the end. It's the bias configuration. So many GPIO controllers have internal configurable resistors. Uh, in the kernel, this is represented as uh, bias pull up or pull down options in the pin control and GPIO subsystems. And uh, now we can finally change these options from user space uh, using the three new flags. There's the pull up, pull down, or bias disable flag. And these work uh, both when requesting lines as well as with the set content IOCL. Uh, so I know that this feature uh, in particular made a couple of folks very happy. And uh, then we have the line watch IOCL. So this is something uh, that uh, I personally uh, really wanted to see because uh, I'm, I'm, I'm interested in, in the user space part of the, uh, of the GPIO interface. So the background for this is the fact that GPIO character device doesn't hold a global state, and this is by design. But some people are used to having some central authority, uh, having control over all the GPIO lines. Uh, and in this case, what, what we're what I'm working on uh, is a GPIO daemon that will, uh, it, uh, it basically it would be responsible uh, for, for uh, controlling the global state of the GPIO. Uh, and in this case, it's uh, useful to always be up to date regarding the current status of lines you control. Um, otherwise, so you want to know if, uh, they, uh, if their status, uh, when, when their status changes, when they are being requested, released, uh, or their config changes. And otherwise you'd have to constantly pull the lines for a uh, config change, um, at, at, at certain intervals. Uh, so the line watch IOCTL allows you to set up, uh, a watch on the line state changes. Uh, and when calling this IOCTL, the current line config is, uh, returned first, uh, so this is how it is. You, we, we call the line uh, watch IOCTL. Uh, 
we, we get the current configuration as it is at the moment. And then we pull the GPIO, uh, the, the file descriptor associated with the GPIO chip. So not the file descriptor return, not the file descriptor associated with, with a certain, with certain lines, but with the chip itself. Uh, and then uh, when any of the lines that are being watched, uh, changes, it's requests, uh, requested, released, uh, or it's config changes, uh, we can read the struct GPI line info changed from the file descriptor and it contains uh, the new configuration. So this is the line info, uh, the timestamp, which is the approximation of when the, the change happened and the event type, which tells you if the line, what happened to the line. Uh, and uh, I've also noted that the, the, the structure contains padding because it's going to be uh, important for uh, uh, when, when I'm going to be talking about uh, what's uh, wrong in the current ABI. So, right. Uh, so, by far the biggest and probably my favorite uh, feature, new feature, is the GPIO aggregator. Uh, it's my favorite to the point where it got its own uh, title slide. So one of the one of the problems uh, with the character device is that it's um, it's a device file in the Unix sense, which means it has uh, modifiable permissions, but they affect all the lines of a chip. They they basically affect the the chip file, the the, the device file, but not uh, single lines. So you cannot have just certain lines accessible to a user and not others. Um, and this, of course, may be undesired, but worry not, because now you can aggregate lines in virtual GPIO chips, of which permissions can be different than those of real chips. So this works like this. Uh, you have, let's say you have two real GPIO chips, uh, only readable and writable by root. So you have chip A and chip B, both with four lines. So let's say that you can, you, you, you want now to make lines uh, zero and two of the first chip and one of the uh, second chip uh, accessible to a user with different permissions. So you can now with the GPIO aggregator create a virtual GPIO chip that will have, that will basically uh, represent the line zero, one and uh, of the first chip and, and two of the second chip. Uh, and you can adjust the permissions uh, as, uh, as, re as required. Uh, and this chip, this new chip, uh, will be visible in the system just like any other GPIO chip. Uh, and the lines in the real chips will be visible in the system as requested by the GPIO aggregator. So the GPIO aggreg aggregator will become the consumer of those lines. So here's a little example on, uh, on how it works. So once you load the, the GPIO aggregator kernel module, uh, if you go to, to sysbus platform drivers GPIO aggregator uh, and list the files, you're going to see some uh, standard attributes uh, and two non-standard ones. So this is the new device and delete device. Uh, so let's say you, you call GPIO detect, which is, I'm, I'm going to be talking about it in, in a second. Uh, it lists the existing uh, GPIO chips in the system. So you, you see we have two chips, uh, the zero and one with their appropriate, uh, appropriate la labels. Uh, this is just the testing module. So now, uh, this is documented in, in, uh, in, the, in the documentation, the Linux source. Uh, if you type the GPIO mockup A and GPIO mockup uh, B, followed by uh, the list comma separated or dash separated, if you, if you want ranges uh, of lines that you want to make part of the new virtual chip, uh, if you, if you uh, put that line into a new device, it's, uh, un un unless there's some error, it's going to create a new virtual file, virtual GPIO chip. Uh, and now when you ls again, uh, the, the, the files, it's here, GPIO aggregator, uh, dot two, because the two is the index of the, of the chip. Uh, and when we call GPIO detect again, uh, we can see that, uh, we have a new GPIO chip, which is, uh, labeled as GPIO aggregator. And then if we print its info, I'm sorry, if we print the info of the, of the first chip, we can see that now GPIO aggregator is the consumer of line zero and two of the, uh, of the real chip GPIO mockup A. Um, so that's it, very simple to use, uh, really recommended. Uh, so now that we have all these uh, new features merged uh, recently, why do we need a whole new version of the ABI? Uh, so the main problem with this user uh, API is the, 
with uh, with with every kernel uh, user API user API is the fact that it's uh, stable uh, and and its stability is enforced. So once released, if anyone in the user space uses it, it must be maintained. Uh, if you get it wrong and only notice once this interface has been adopted, uh, then either you uh, left some margin for error uh, in the way you implemented it, or you're stuck with a bad API. Unfortunately, some problems were identified with the GPIO character device, uh, and some of them simply can't be fixed. So first one is uh, a rather uncommon use case uh, that is running a 64-bit kernel with 32-bit user space, which is perfectly valid. Uh, but in GPIO, this is uh, this has been broken for a couple of years, uh, ever, ever since the, the character device has been merged. Uh, but it's been a couple of years until someone spotted it. Um, so basically what happens is that we have this struct GPIO event data, uh, which is read from the file descriptor created when requesting lines for event monitoring. Uh, and this structure looks differently from the 64-bit uh, kernel and 32-bit uh, user space point of view. On 64-bit, uh, on, on, on 64 bits, the structure has an implicit 32-bit padding at the end, uh, so that it's uh, so that, it, so that it, it's it's 46 bit aligned. Uh, so if both the kernel and user space uh, have the same alignment, all is fine. But in the case of a 64-bit uh, kernel and 32-bit user space, suddenly the kernel is sending a structure to the user space, which the user space isn't expecting. Because what, what the user space is expecting is a 96-byte uh, uh, structure and not 128. So this, of course, cannot work. Uh, I think it was Andy Shevchenko tried to fix it at some point, but uh, the, basically we would end up with a lot of ugly code, uh, and eventually it's been decided to just uh, fix it properly in V2. So another issue is uh, what I mentioned before. Uh, it's the padding. So I, I, as, as I said before, uh, you may, uh, when designing a user ABI, you, you may uh, leave some margin for error. Unfortunately, we didn't do that. So if the structure you're using for an IOCTL, uh, for IOCTL parameters has some unused fields, uh, you can use them to extend given uh, IOCTL with new features. Um, but we don't have any, any, any such fields at the end appended, so, so no, 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 basically no padding. Or rather, we only recently, uh, with the set config IOCTL, we uh, started to add padding for future use. Uh, we probably just didn't know any better at the, at the time, but it turned out that uh, only adding new flags sometimes isn't enough um, as, as, a, uh, as a new new feature. Because when it turned out that the debounce period is something that the user space should be able to configure and monitoring line events, uh, we unfortunately didn't have any place to put uh, that value in. So uh, yeah, padding padding is uh, important if if you think that uh, you're gonna extend your uh, API in the future. Uh, and another thing is using the right timers. So the GPIO event timestamps uh, for a long time we're using the real time clock, but the thing with the real time clock is that it's not guaranteed to always advance. It can go backwards in certain circumstances. So the right clock to use in this case is the monotonic clock. Um, this has been actually fixed in the in the following commit. GPIO switch time timestamps time to K time get an S. Uh, but this uh, technically is uh, ADI breakage. Uh, we just decided to uh, do it and see if anyone complains, and nobody did. So uh, so it stayed like this. And V two will of course use the monotonic clock uh, right away. Uh, so. Then we had uh, several requests for sensible new features. Um, so uh, we tried initially to limit the GPIO character device functionalities to not encourage people to overuse it more than for prototyping or some limited uh, scope of use cases. However, some requests make sense. Uh, so we're okay with adding them, but it's simply impossible in V1. Uh, I mentioned before uh, the debound period for events. Uh, well, bias settings is, is something that we already have, uh, but then something like event sequence numbering. Uh, this is another one that's uh, that's useful because it uh, if the kernel buffer overflows or the order somehow gets lost between the hired IRQ and and thread uh, IRQ handlers, um, it's good to keep the right sequencing in user space. Uh, right now we we can't add it because yeah, it's it's another field for which we don't have space in in, uh, in the structures we have now. 
Uh, and so uh, the work has started on the mailing list to implement the second version of the GPIO character device. So what's going on? Uh, the first version of the V2 API has been proposed on the LKML, LKMA, LK, LKML sorry, and is being right now discussed. Uh, the V1, of course, has to stay in place, uh, so it will be maintained. Uh, the 64-bit kernel to 32-bit user space problems are fixed. Um, so is the missing padding. We now have the possibility to extend the structures even further if needed. And also all the flags have been reworked and the line event uh, and line handle requests have been merged into one because there is no good reason to keep them separate. So just to give you some examples on what we did. So uh, the merging of the two request types uh, is for a good reason, because right now you can request multiple lines for values for uh, doing the get or set operations but you can only request a single line at a, at a time for events. Uh, and every time you request a line uh, to, to monitor its events, uh, you get a new file descriptor. And you can, of course, pull uh, all these file, file descriptors at once. There is no issue with that, but you have to use a, sing, a, a, a single file descriptor per monitored line. And there's actually no good reason to do that. Uh, so, yeah. So we may be, uh, even in libgpiod, we actually uh, wrap it uh, in, in, a, in, a, in a single object. So the user actually, in, when using libgpiod, the, the user doesn't see that uh, we actually have multiple line descriptors uh, or, or one, one file descriptor per line. So what will, what will happen in v2, uh, we will uh, merge these two requests together or rather, we will still have two request types, uh, but we will always uh, use uh, sets of lines and operate on them. Um, and uh, the, the edge detection or edge event detection will, will simply become another flag. And when talking about flags, so right now we have a single 32-bit uh, field for all the flags uh, and uh, they all, a lot of them conflict with one another logically. Uh, and that makes parsing these options in the kernel a nightmare, and it's also uh, easy to get it wrong. So uh, in V2, they will actually be enums, uh, and, and uh, like they will be enumerated types. Uh, and yeah, we will have a separate type for direction, a separate type for drive, a separate type uh, for bias, and a separate type for edge detection. And this way, uh, it will be impossible to get it uh, wrong because you, you will simply only choose one from uh, each set. Um, yeah, so there's uh, a lot of small implementation details in which I, uh, in, in this, which I won't be covering, uh, but uh, we now seem to have something much better and thoroughly, thoroughly designed. So uh, right now I wanted to just talk a bit about libgpiod, which is the user space uh, wrapper around the row ioctal calls, uh, the goal of which is to make them easier to use provide uh, lots of convenience helpers and, and uh, a set of command line tools and also bindings to uh, higher level langu languages. So yeah, just a bit of history in the, in, in the beginning. So the reason for me to write libgpid was uh, the support for uh, power switches on Belibre Acme probes. Uh, we have this uh, power consumption measurement device. Uh, so these, uh, these power switches were basically GPIOs exposed by uh, GPIO expanders, uh, but I tried to model them somehow initially. First as uh, IIO, industrial IIO uh, and in the Linux kernel attributes, but this was uh, shut down because, and rightfully so, because uh, these GPIOs were not really part of any driver conceptually. Um, so then I switched uh, to the regulator framework and I tried to model them uh, as regulators controlled from user space, but this was shut down by Mark Brown, the, the maintainer of the regulator subsystem. And uh, again, uh, this, this has been discussed in the past that uh, regulator, regulators should not be controllable from user space. And uh, finally, it turned out that using the GPIO character device is the way to go. So first version was released in January 2017. This was at the time still a work in progress effort, uh, but uh, a year later, the 1.0 stable API was released. Uh, right now we have a current stable version is uh, 1.5.1. 1 .1. Actually the slide says it's uh, .2, but I'm, I'm going to make this release this, uh, this week. Uh, 
uh, and this release needs kernel 5.5. Uh, I'm still supporting the 1.4 series because uh, it's the version that works with the Linux uh, with Linux 5.4 uh, long-term uh, support version. Uh, and as soon as we get the version uh, 2 IOCTO substream, uh, we'll start working on a new major version of libgpiod because uh, certain things will need to change in the API in order to adapt the new uh, kernel interface. So these changes will not be backward compatibility, compa compatible, uh, hence the new major release that we're planning. So what's inside? So we have a uh, C API of the core library. Uh, it's fully documented in Doxygen. Uh, we have a set of command line tools. Uh, so we have GPIO detect that lists uh, the, the chips present in the system. We have GPIO info that prints uh, information about uh, chips and lines. We have GPIO set and GPIO get. Uh, these programs allow to uh, set and uh, read uh, current values of GPIO lines. And finally, we have GPIO find, which allows you to uh, look up lines by name. Um, and also we have uh, GPIO uh, mon, which allows you to monitor line events from command line. Uh, we have a custom test suite. This works together with the GPIO mockup kernel module uh, and interrupt simulator in the kernel. And we have, again, fully documented uh, bindings to uh, C++ and Python. Uh, I, as, as far as I know, at least the Python bindings are, are pretty widely used. Um, and uh, new features. So in uh, 1.5, we've added support for the bias flags and the set config IOCTL. Um, we also switched to using uh, proper testing frameworks. So what we do now, we use the, the glib unit testing for the core library. We use, CAT, we use CATCH2 for C++ uh, bindings. We use Python unit test for Python bindings. And then uh, for the command line tools, we use the BATS, which is the Bash automated testing suite, I think. Uh, what will change in the, uh, in the 2.0.x uh, series? So we're going to have a completely new API that will uh, work with the new kernel interface. Uh, we will introduce uh, jelly bindings and, uh, and a dbus daemon, uh, which will be the first uh, daemon to hold the global state of GPIO lines. Uh, we'll implement GPIO watch, will be a, which will be a, uh, a command line tool for watching uh, li state changes of GPIO lines. So basically, uh, this, will, this will use the line watch IOCTL. And also something that the slide uh, doesn't mention is uh, changes in how we look up lines by name, because uh, it turned out that a significant thing that we missed uh, in libgpiod is the fact that uh, line names are not unique, neither uh, for a chip, uh, neither globally as, as well as for a chip. So basically multiple lines in the chip can have the same name. Nothing uh, stops, stops us from doing that. Uh, unfortunately, the current version of libgpid is not aware of that, so we're going to have to work on this as well. Uh, and uh, yeah, so that's actually it. Uh, it went faster than I thought. So uh, uh, I'm going to be here for uh, for you to answer the questions. I'd like to say thank you to uh, Kent Gibson who uh, wrote the the V2, so who's working mostly on the on the V2 of GP, uh, GPIO UAPI. Um, and I'll also would like to say uh, thank you to uh, Hert Eiterhufe, who's, uh, who's, who, who's implemented the GPIO aggregator, which is uh, my uh, really, really, uh, just a uh, really nice uh, tool. And uh, that's it. Okay, so I'm open to questions. So let me just skim through, through the questions that are already here. So Christopher is asking, I like the SysFS interface since it was possible to easily modify from a script. Is this still possible with the new GPIO character device? Of course, it's not possible uh, to do it with uh, IOCTL calls, but uh, libgpiod has a set, as, as I said, has a set of command line tools, uh, which is uh, which makes it uh, quite convenient, I think. I, I, I use it in scripts, so uh, definitely uh, you should check it out. You can even monitor events and uh, adjust the format in which the events are uh, printed to uh, to be easily parsable by by script. Uh, so I have used EPO to, to 
Jade, I, I, I think uh, it's the name. Uh, I have used EPOL to attempt to cut GPIO edges in specific hardware, IMX6. Is that reliable and does it suffer from race conditions that you have solved with your current work? Uh, unfortunately, I'm, I'm, I'm not... Uh, the race conditions you mean the the ones i i uh we that we fixed with the gp with the character device uh in regards to uh to the cfs we should probably move that to to slack i, I can be of help uh, with that but i i need to understand the question better so what is the overhead of using the gpio aggregator as compared to direct access to the actual hardware gpio chips uh, so I haven't measured it, uh, but uh, basically what happens is that the kernel uh, GPIO aggregator module requests the lines from uh, from the from the real module. Um, there is a bit of overhead, but uh, not much. Uh, I, I I will check it out and uh, and and see on Slack uh, and answer you on Slack. So Robert is asking. When a line is added to a virtual GPIO chip with GPIO aggregator, is it possible to access the line through both the real chip and the virtual chip? Or is the line only accessible through the virtual chip now? So you can read line info uh, from the real chip, but you cannot request the line. You can only now request it from the GPIO aggregator um, because there, there can only be one user of a line. And uh, conceptually, the GPIO aggregator becomes the user of uh, this line in uh, of, of the line uh, on the real chip. Uh, Drew is asking, is it a good idea to declare in device tree that I want to use certain GPIO lines from user space? Um, uh, it's a good question. I don't know. Uh, first, I don't think we have uh, we have any any means to do that. We probably uh, we probably can use the name for that, that it's somehow used, marked to, to be used from user space, but uh, right now, so no, it's, it's not a good idea because device tree is uh, describing the hardware. Uh, I, I think that uh, every time something like this pops up, uh, Rob Herring uh, is, is against it and, and says that device tree should focus on uh, describing the hardware and not uh, describing the implementation details. So uh, I, I modify my answer, it's, uh, it's no. Uh, and Drew, again, on BeagleBone, I can set the GPIO max mode and pin control device tree properties, but how can I specify that I want to use the corresponding GPIO lines with the GPIO D? Is it useful to specify? Yeah, so this is uh, this is the same. This is related to the question above. Uh, in DT, this shouldn't be specified, basically. Um, and uh, Drew, one complaint I've gotten from users is that the GPIO D user API has no way to keep a line set after the process ends. They said this makes SysFS better for them. Any solution for that scenario? Yes. Uh, so this is something I mentioned. Uh, we many users uh, want something to to store the global state of GPIO lines. Um, I have this is a, in, in, this has been in my to do for uh, for far too long. But uh, I will at some point implement a uh, very simple daemon written in C together with a client. Uh, that will hold the global state and expose it to the client. Uh, and and uh, basically, as long as the daemon will be active, uh, you will be able to set the state of a line and, and keep it that way. Uh, also, something that uh, that is already that I I've, I've been already working on for some time now is the dbus uh, daemon uh, and and a set of dbus uh, bindings. This, of course, will will keep the state of uh, a glo global state of line of lines. Uh, like the state of lines will be kept even after the client program exits, uh, if it so wishes. Uh, and yeah, otherwise, this is how character devices work in Linux, uh, and, and and this is by design. So so uh, yeah, uh, the, the the most we can do is, is implement a daemon that will stay alive and uh, and be a um, an intermediate between the between the uh, the GPIO character device and the and the client programs. So I think for now, there are no more questions. Uh, I will stay on Slack, of course, uh, to, to answer any more questions. Uh, so if we have time, I can go back to the questions that we had before. Uh, answer live. 
So I have used EPO to attempt to cut GPIO edges in specific. So this is this was the question from from Jade. Um, I, I will read it again. It's uh, I have used EPO to attempt to cut GPIO edges in specific hardware. Is that reliable? And does it suffer from race conditions that you have solved with your current work? So if you've done it using SysFS, yes, this is racy and uh, it's not reliable. If you if you switch to the character device, it's now going to be more reliable it's not 100 percent reliable because the buffer in the kernel can overflow uh but it's going to be much much more reliable than sysfs another question from uh, drew uh, any other bindings than c and python plant yes so kent gibson who wrote uh, who implemented the set config ioctl and um, and the bias uh, then support for bias flags uh works on his uh, Go library, it's not binding. So basically, it's, it's not related to libgpid. It's a standalone library written in Go. Uh, but I know it's uh, it's functional, and uh, Kent is, uh, Kent is uh, actively supporting it. I uh, Google for, for the name, because I, I don't even know Go GPIO. Uh, it's called GPIO simply. It's a native uh, Go library for Resb Raspberry Pi GPIO. Oh, actually, it's for Raspberry. Okay, so it's called GPIOD. It's a native Go library for Linux GPIO and it uses the character device. Yeah. Okay, so uh, if there are no more questions, Okay, so if there are no more questions, uh, I think this is it, uh, and I'll see you on Slack then. Thank you very much.